You're listening to Indications by the Conference Board. Hello, I'm Sarah Murray, Managing Director International of the Conference Board and the host of this podcast. Today's conversation will focus on the Ukraine-Russia crisis, macro issues. Joining me today is Samantha de Bendern. Samantha uh, is an Associate Fellow at Chatham House and has recently joined Lowe as an Associate and will be helping to build Lowe's consultancy in specialist areas such as countering disinformation as well as supporting Lowe's strategic communications work with its client NATO. Welcome Samantha. Good morning, happy to be here. Thank you for for your time today. We've got a lot uh, to get through. Um, You know, of of, of course, as we all know, the situation is um, rapidly uh, developing every day. Um, But I think let's start with some of the macro issues um, and uh, see how how we how much we can cover today. So um, NATO and and Russia, you know, what next? We know that NATO will not fight for Ukraine. But at what point do you think NATO would reconsider uh, military intervention in in Ukraine. Also, um, we've heard that President Putin recently said that any country that interferes with them would face consequences greater than you have seen in history. Should this be taken as a serious threat of a nuclear attack? What's your response to that? Well, I'll I'll try and start off with the tackling the NATO front. So NATO has indeed said that it will not provide boots on the ground. But there are many other ways in which NATO can help Ukraine. So first of all, as I'm sure everybody knows, NATO is providing weapons to Ukraine, both in the NATO context and in bilateral contexts. There are also increasing uh, armies of volunteers going into Ukraine, mainly from the Baltic republics, from Poland. You have, uh, I've heard recently, Liz Truss saying that she would Mm. not um, prosecute or oppose any British men or women who want to go to Ukraine as volunteer fighters. We uh, can provide them with intelligence, uh, reconnaissance intelligence, and that is already being done through the use of drones, uh, helping the Ukrainians pinpoint the Russian positions on the ground. There is no reason why at some point, uh, particularly the Americans could not consider providing cyber assistance to Ukraine in helping them counter counter any cyber attacks or indeed carry out cyber attacks that would help them in their fight against Russia. But the big question here, of course, is when would NATO engage itself militarily in a a, a more formal and more dramatic way? Now, the only way, according to, to, to NATO, the NATO Charter, the only way in which NATO would engage itself militarily at this point would be if another country that was part of the alliance was under direct attack from Russia. Mm. However, there has been a precedent of NATO acting as the alliance unilaterally when it felt that its interests were directly under attack. And that is when Kosovo was bombed in 1999, which is what really brought an end to the uh, regime of Slobodan Milosevic in Yugoslavia. Mm. The big difference here, of course, is that Slobodan Milosevic did not have nuclear weapons and Yugoslavia was a very small country that was very easily to overcome militarily. Ukraine is a completely different kettle of fish. So at this point, I don't see NATO engaging with direct military confrontation with Russia. The second question you've asked is about Putin's threat. This is a very clear threat that should be taken very, very seriously. And Russia has put its nuclear arsenal on um, not the highest alert, but the second highest alert. The highest alert is when you actually start pressing buttons. So there are a number of things to to, to bear in mind here. First of all, he can't activate um, the the strategic weapons alone. The strategic weapons are the big intercontinental missiles that you you see in in disaster movies, you go from one part of the globe to another and uh, annihilate whole cities or whole continents. He would have to, um, there's a chain of command. And the question there is, would 
his uh, generals obey him. But that is not really what he's talking about with this threat. He's threatening the use of tactical nuclear weapons. Tactical nuclear weapons are uh, weapons that can be used in the battlefield to inflict small scale damage. It, it's still very, very damaging. It's still more than anything we have ever seen in the history of humanity in terms of conventional warfare. I mean, apart from, from the, the, the Hiroshima bombing, I'm talking about worse than anything we've seen on a battlefield since the beginning of humanity. That is what this threat is about. Well, that is certainly how military experts are interpreting this threat, that these would be tactical weapons that could be used either in Ukraine or in some sort of warning to the West. And in this context, it's really important to um, bear in mind that Russia changed its military doctrine in 2020. And in this new military doctrine, the Russians now allow themselves to use nuclear weapons as a first strike. They call it escalate to de-escalate. The logic being that if you inflict massive damage on the enemy, the enemy will have no choice but to surrender. So there would be a de-escalation after that. That is mm -hmm. now in Russia's military doctrine and has been adopted. And this was two years ago. So we have known this for two years. The problem we have here is that in NATO member states, whether it's our collective NATO defence or the individual defence that the UK and France have that is independent from any orders coming from, from NATO and from American control, we do not have a very strong tactical deterrence. What that means is that if we were to try to deter Putin or respond to a tactical nuclear attack on NATO territory, with our own nuclear response, we only have strategic weapons. And that would be met most likely with the strategic response. And that is why this situation is so worrying. And it is the result of um, decades of, of disarmament and decades of ignoring the mindset in Russia. So the situation is, is worrying, mm, to say the least. Chilling very chilling indeed could could you talk a little bit more about the activation of nato's defense plan um and is that you know is that likely to happen well nato already has acted its um its its defense plan so what this means is that nato has positioned troops on in the countries that border ukraine and this also can take uh, can take the form of, of, of more um, forward presence in, in the sea and in the airs. But this is a defensive position. Now, this has never been activated to defend NATO's borders. This 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 um, forward defense um, this joint forward force has been activated. It was activated in twenty. 15 to uh, help certain member states deal with natural disasters and flooding. It was um, activated in Afghanistan to help with the withdrawal of NATO forces in Afghanistan. It has never been activated to protect NATO's borders. So this is a major event in Alliance history. Hmm. But it is purely defensive. And that is the message that has also been sent very clearly to President Putin. He's choosing to make this into something very different as a direct uh, attempt to invade. But it, it is very important and very serious. Mm. The, um, a lot of... Sorry, go on. No, the, the, other, um, the other danger here is that uh, I think Putin has seriously underestimated Western resolve here. Mm. He saw the American withdrawal of Afghanistan as a sign of American weakness, America's desire to disengage from the world stage and lack of unity in the alliance. What he's got in response has been a much more united alliance than it was just one month ago. Mm. The danger here is that if he feels cornered and if he feels that he's going to collapse, he, he, he could, the temptation to use at least tactical nukes will be much greater. 
Mm, no, you're right. I mean, again, there's been a lot said about, you know, trying to keep the diplomatic lines open, isn't it? So that he still does feel that there's a way out. So indeed, this does not escalate, um, you know, to that worst case um, scenario. So it's a very, you know, I think the West um, have to be very mindful to tread very carefully so that this does not, you know, escalate um, in in the wrong way. Um a lot of NATO countries, you know, as you, as you've mentioned, you know, they're they're supplying weapons to to Ukraine. Do do you foresee that you know this is almost uh, you know an even more uh, risk, you know, with the the NATO Russia conflict? And where else do you see the risk of conflict now between Russia and NATO countries that could spill over into something worse? So um, the fact that we're providing weapons to Ukraine. Uh, of course, does uh, escalate the potential for conflict with Russia, not least because these weapons have to be delivered either by air mm. or by sea. By sea is going to be quite difficult right now since most of the major ports are falling, but by air or by land. And during the delivery process, the, the potential for coming across Russian troops is, is pretty serious. So that is definitely one area in which there could be... Um, it could be potential for escalation, but there are some 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 weak some weak points, some some potential hotspots where Putin could be tempted to test Allied resolve. There is a place called Kaliningrad, which, if you imagine of your a map of Europe, imagine Lithuania, which is the westernmost Baltic state, and next to Lithuania, there's an enclave that belongs to Russia that is sandwiched between. Lithuania and Germany. And there is a little bit of Lithuania that covers Kaliningrad and slides down into Belarus. And this is called the Sawalki Gap, it belongs to Lithuania. It's a tiny little corridor. If that corridor belonged to Belarus, it would provide direct link between Kaliningrad and Belarus. Therefore, get rid of Kaliningrad's um, complete isolation within uh, the European Union and NATO member states. Belarus has now been de facto overtaken by Russia. If Putin wanted to provide a, a land corridor from Kaliningrad into Belarus, the Suwalki Gap would be the place he would look to attack. Mm. And this is somewhere where he could try to test Allied resolve to see whether Article 5 really would be, um, be implemented. Mm. And Article 5 is the um, article in the North Atlantic Treaty, according to which an attack on one member is an attack on all, and there is a collective obligation to respond. And here again is the most interesting question, because Article 5 doesn't just come into effect immediately. There has to be consensus. And the question mm. that some European allies are asking themselves is, would America mm. um, come to Europe's rescue this time, considering yeah. how high the stakes are? Or would it just let these little countries fall under, under Russian domination? Because, again, the alternatives are too horrible to even think of. Mm. Um, Russia, China is also, um, you know, another area where where, where many are keenly um, observing. What what are your thoughts on you know the Russia China axis and how could this impact U.S. and European business leaders? So this is a really important question, and we have seen a seismic shift in the last month that has gone unnoticed by a lot of observers. Just before the opening of the Beijing Games, uh, Russia and China came out with a long, I think 17 or 18 page document on uh, cementing their friendship and solidarity and cooperation. And this pledges each country to cooperate in every single possible area you could imagine from Arctic exploration to um, R&D in sensitive industries, to energy cooperation, to cultural cooperation, to supporting each other's foreign policy goals. So what does that mean? It means that Russia came out in support of China's One China policy. This means that Russia now supports China's claim on Taiwan, which is 
a major shift. And mm. China has come out publicly condemning NATO expansion. And he, it, there was no direct mention of Ukraine, but the subtext was that this is about Russia's designs on Ukraine and potentially Russia's designs on the rest of the countries that it feels should not belong to NATO or should never belong to NATO. The document was also chilling in the sense that they gave a vision of a, a world under which their own visions of democracy are as valid as other visions of democracy and that each, each country should have its own way of being democratic. So as a woman reading that, it's like sort of saying, well, each woman has her own way of being pregnant. You know, mm. either you have a democracy with a separation of powers, with a functioning parliament where there's a real opposition, where you have an independent judiciary, where you have freedom of speech and the freedom to, to change your government if you want to, or you don't. There is no real halfway in democracy. And this was a very chilling government because it showed an absolute um, transparent desire to forge at least part of the world in their own vision, which is a joint vision. Now, it really remains to be seen how far this would go in reality, because Russia needs China now a lot more than China needs Russia. China also needs the Western markets for its manufactured goods. And if Western sanctions towards Russia starts to extend to regimes that aid and abet Russia, China will have to reconsider its position very, very, very carefully. However, the potential flashpoint here, of course, is Taiwan. And all analysts are saying if the West shows um, uh, insufficient will to, to stand up for Ukraine, then China might take this as a sign that it can go and attack Taiwan. But Samantha, I mean, interesting, China, with all of that said, China, like you, you know, you mentioned, but they still have to walk, you know, a, a fine path. And they recently abstained, didn't they, you know, um, at the UN at a recent vote, which, which, you know, to some analysts would suggest, you know, more caution than they went into this with, you know. So, um, you know, I think there's there's a lot of grey there, isn't there, in terms of how, how they'll, you know, what their next steps will be and whether it will be, you know, complete alignment with Russia or, as I said, a careful calculation given the relationship with the West. I agree. I mean, I'm not a China specialist, but uh, I am speaking to China specialists. And they think that even China is uh, shocked at the yeah. scale of what Russia is doing in Ukraine. Mm. Yeah. Um, one final question before before the break. You know, we've recently seen Zelensky, um, you know, signing the application for uh, EU membership. Um, you know, um, uh, we've also seen, you know, uh, the EU kind of respond with, you know, with, with you know, this takes years, um, you know, this isn't a quick fix. Um, you know, would it be possible that the EU could turn around and say, oh, yeah, you know, we could do this in, a, you know, a few weeks as, as also another kind of chip to to send a warning shot to Russia? Or you think that that is not uh, likely? No, it won't be a quick, a quick fix. I mean, it, it would be, in a way, easier for NATO for Ukraine to join NATO than for Ukraine to join the EU because of the of the regulatory requirements for a country to join the EU, and the the the, 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 necess, the necessity of this to be ratified by every single EU member state, and 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 particularly the the, the long haul over overhaul of an economy. So that that is not something that, that could happen easily. There could be a symbolic extension of a, a new form of, of association, maybe, perhaps if, if EU countries ha have that imagination. But th this, to me, I read this more as a, as, as a public relations stunt, as, as mm. basically a statement by Ukraine. We want to be part of your club. And not only are we not uh, changing our minds in the face of Russian invasion, we are more resolute than ever. So it, it was probably more of a of of, of a, uh, a public relations stunt towards his own people to begin with, and towards the rest of the world. 
mm. but it's not 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 going to happen overnight well we've talked about the nato and russia relationship the nato defense plan the russia and china axis um uh, next uh, you know we'll look at non-aligned country considerations you know what oil and gas producing countries could do next um, we're going to take a short break uh, and we'll be right back with more of my conversation with Samantha. Interested in more insights on the current Russian-Ukrainian crisis? Visit our geopolitics hub at conferenceboard.org forward slash topics forward slash geopolitics. Here you can find a range of easily accessible insights in the form of webcasts, podcasts, research briefs and more. New resources are being added regularly to help you lead with confidence. Welcome back to Indications Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Murray, Managing Director International of the Conference Board, and I'm joined today by Samantha DeBenden. So, Samantha, let's talk about India. Uh, Modi spoke with uh, US President Biden recently um, and... um, you know, Biden was was non-committal about India in in the press conference. You know, how do you see Modi positioning himself on 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 this, um, which you know may play out, uh, you know, with time, but but you know could also be uh, important to the success or failure of the US, NATO, EU um, allies pushback against President Putin. Yeah, absolutely. India's position is is being very ambiguous, and you have to remember that uh, Narendra Modi is a, a a despot in the making and uh, admires the kind of, of 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 regime that that Putin is is putting in place. Although I think that even he would not um, condone uh, the, both the repression of free speech and the internal politics in Russia, but. On the one hand, from a security, from a from a sea security point of view, maritime security point of view, India is very much allied with uh, what's called the Quads, which is an alliance of the U.S., Japan, and Australia, um, policing the, the the seas around India, particularly what's called the String of Pearls, which are islands around India that China has designs on. So, in in that respect, India is very much aligned with 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 certain NATO allies in Japan. On the other hand, the largest important state on India in India's north is actually Russia. And um, India has has had, even during the Cold War, very strong ties to the Soviet Union, and those ties continued in the Russian era. India has just bought um, some um, some SU-400 missile defense systems from from Russia. It is a large consumer, very large consumer of Russian oil and is probably uh, thinking that in a way, potential sanctions that Russia may want to respond uh, to the West with by uh, reducing oil supplies that India could benefit from this. Um, India wants a permanent seat on the UN Security Council, so it would need Russian approval for this. But it, 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 is, it is very, very relevant because um, India, I think, will find it very hard to remain neutral here. And I think it will come under a lot of pressure from Western allies to take a position. You also have to factor mm-hmm. in to this that Imran Khan in, in Pakistan seems to be courting Russia as well. I mean, Imran Khan was actually in Moscow on February 24th, the day the hostilities against Ukraine began. So there's a potentially interesting shift in alliances happening there where Pakistan was traditionally allied more with the US and India more with Russia or the Soviet Union and and things seem to be shifting. So it's a very fluid situation and one that will be uh, really very much in in the radar of foreign policy strategists and the intelligence community to see whether India will move from its neutrality to a more pro-Western or, God forbid, more pro-Eastern stance, which seems pretty unlikely. And India's shift would probably depend on what happens with China. Because if China Mm. begins to disengage itself from Russia now after what's happened in Ukraine, India might feel more comfortable realigning itself closer to the West. 
But if India mm -hmm. feels threatened by these two giants on its borders, both China and Russia, it might stay neutral or even potentially shift its alliance altogether. But right now, I'd say all the cards are on the table, which itself is quite a worrying situation. It is, it is indeed, and one to obviously carefully monitor, you know, as, as the situation unfolds. Um, let's, let's talk now a, bit, a little bit about the oil and gas producing countries, you know, mm. of the Gulf um, and the Middle East. You know, do they have a dog in this, in this fight? And if they do, you know, what are the issues that could influence their decision making and, and how could these decisions Im impact Western business leaders? Well, there's one very big issue regarding um, the Gulf countries is that they depend on, on Russia and Ukraine a lot for their food imports. And so if they are, if Russia manages to gain control of Ukraine and suffers more sanctions, it could retaliate with sanctions to withhold its sales of food products to the West. And to any allies that the West may have. And that could be very, very serious indeed for the, 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 the oil producing nations because you know they have lots of oil, but if they can't feed their population, then mm. you know, they're not gonna start <laughs> drinking oil and gas, are they? So the, mm. the, this, this would be a consideration. Um, arms procurements, I mean, you know, the Gulf countries are, are look, you know, swing both ways when it comes to, to arms procurements. Now that Switzerland in particular has um, joined the EU in, uh, in sanctions on Russia, Russians will be looking to Dubai to place their money and to spend it. And this could be a very interesting source of income for, for the UAE. So they, uh, they do have perhaps not an ideological uh, bone to, to throw into the into, in, into the arena here, but certainly a financial one and potentially existential one as well with food supplies. Mm. Um, we talked a bit earlier uh, about you know the defense plan and, and some of um, Putin's um, uh, uh, you know moves that he could make. Um, anything more that you could say about you know do you think? Um, one should expect Putin to go into EU or NATO territory? At this point, I don't think that he he can. Um, certainly not with a ground invasion. I mean, he, yeah. a large proportion, and I was reading earlier on today, I think something like 60 or 70% of Russia's armed forces are now concentrating on Ukraine uh, to, to the extent to which, you know, who, who's there to defend Russia? So a ground invasion into, into an EU member state, apart from small border skirmishes in the, in, in, in the Baltics or in, in Poland, if, if he manages to take the whole of Ukraine, seems unlikely. However, this military weakness is perhaps um, the most dangerous issue of all, is that if he does decide that he wants to teach us a lesson. He could use non-conventional warfare. And one thing I haven't mentioned, of course, are the um, biological and chemical weapons. Uh, mm. Putin has used chemical weapons on British soil and has contaminated um, parts of the United Kingdom with chemical weapons. It has also used radiological weapons on chemical soil. So radiological weapons would be uh, substances that are part of the nuclear arms industry but that don't actually cause explosions and I'm talking about polonium here which not only poisoned Alexander Litvinenko the former spy but left a trail of radioactivity around London. There is a fear here among military analysts that to begin with Russia might decide to use chemical weapons in Ukraine because those have there's a not dispersed as widely as a nuclear weapon would be. They can cause a lot more localized damage. And who knows, maybe that would be a way of teaching a lesson to NATO allies as well, but keeping things contained in a localized way and also maintaining um, deniability. Um, chemical and biological substances can be dispersed in small quantities without, um, without using 
um, uh, you know, lo lo you know, cruise missiles or, or, or military launch hardware. They, they, they can be dispersed, you know, in, in small vials. And there's also the uh, potential of deniability. Although I think at this point, if Putin wants to teach us a lesson, he would make sure that we knew it was him. Hmm. But that, 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 is, that is a concern. Samantha, thank you so much um, for joining us today and providing our listeners with, you know, with the state of affairs uh, with the Russia-Ukraine crisis. We've heard uh, about, um, you know, the NATO's posture on, um, you know, direct military intervention, um, you know, or, or not. We've heard a lot about, um, you know, the risks of escalation and, um, you know, this very careful game to try and de-escalate um, uh, the situation, uh, the changing uh, Russia-China axis and how India, you know, is obviously um, a key player in that and, and, and watching carefully um, and, um, you know, a uh, very, very serious situation. And um, I just can't thank you enough for, for spending the time with us today to share uh, your anal analysis with us. Yeah, I... I um... I would like to say that it's been a pleasure here, but the topic that we are, are discussing is, is not one that I'm having much pleasure in discussing. But thank you very much for having me, and I hope that your, your listeners find this interesting and not too depressing. Thank you. Yeah. Um, please do please do share this um, Indications podcast with your colleagues. Um, I'm Sarah Murray, and this podcast has been brought to you by the Conference Board. This has been Indications from the Conference Board.